Hey folks, my name is Rebecca Turner, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be talking about Rust for non-systems programmers. Don't worry about taking notes, all the code I'm going to be showing you, as well as these slides and a rough transcript, are available online. And I'm going to wait a little bit so people can copy down these links. So, I'm a non-systems programmer. Before learning Rust, I mostly wrote Python, and now Rust is pretty much my favorite language. But if you looked at the rustlang.org website before 2019, that might not make a lot of sense to you. Here's the rustlang.org website at the end of 2018, right before they rolled out the new site. The headline emphasizes systems programming, speed, and memory safety, all things I don't directly care about that much. And here's the new website today in mid-2020. Now Rust is about empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software, and the website focuses on reliability and productivity. But a lot of the documentation is lagged behind and still assumes that new Rust programmers already know C++ or something similar. That made it really hard for me to learn Rust. I've never really understood memory management, so a lot of the documentation was pretty inaccessible for me. I want to talk about how we can use Rust as non-systems programmers without getting too bogged down into the details of optimization and memory management. Before we start writing code, let's take a quick look at some of the things Rust makes strikingly easy. And don't worry if I go through these quickly, we'll come back to these features soon. Rust can do command line argument parsing generated from a type definition with automatic typo correction while generating tab completion scripts and man pages at compile time. Rust can give great error reports for complex errors while automatically deserializing JSON to a custom type. And Rust can output fancy test diffs with a one-line import that integrates with the default test framework. Rust can do a whole lot more too, but I don't want to just list random Rust features for 30 minutes. When I was learning Rust, a process that had three or four false starts since about 2016, I kept getting halfway through writing a program before I'd get stuck on a compiler error I couldn't figure out. So we're going to write a non-trivial Rust program together and see how we can solve a lot of common problems in a rusty way without worrying about the finer details that I have a hard time understanding. There's a lot of Rust features and tools that aren't important to me as a Python programmer, and I'm going to pretty much skip over those entirely. We're not going to optimize anything because the totally naive program we're going to write takes a tenth of a second to run, and almost all that time is spent waiting on some network requests. We're not going to talk about macros or a lot of the fancy type system features Rust has or pointers. I'm not even going to say the words heap or stack or allocate. If it wouldn't matter in Python or JavaScript or Ruby, it wouldn't matter here. I have ADHD and it varies from person to person, but one area I really struggle with is working memory, which is roughly how much information you can hold in your head at once. And as an engineer, that means that I can't hold much of the program concept in my mind while I work. It's really important that I have a powerful compiler, linters, and tests, because otherwise I have no way of knowing that the program's correct. Type annotations and auto-completion aren't optional niceties for me. It's essential that my tools tell me which operations are supported on which variables, because otherwise I have to look them up nearly every time. Rust really shines in all these areas. I work with my compiler to check my work, and it helps me feel a lot more confident that my programs do what I think they do. Before we start looking at code, I want to point out a few of the tools that make writing Rust easy and fun. We have RustDoc, which compiles doc comments written in Markdown to web pages, complete with search, links, and more. We also have MDBook for writing longer form narrative style documentation. MDBook was created to write the Rust book, the main source of Rust documentation. We have two very good language servers for auto completion, definition jumping, quick fixes, and more. RLS is distributed with Rust itself, and Rust Analyzer is a community project. And we also have Cargo, a package manager and build system integrating with the crates.io package repository, 
that handles everything from dependency resolution to building documentation, running tests, and benchmarking. Here's the generated documentation for the RAND crate, which you can find at docs.rs RAND. When we open it up, we can see the overview they wrote, and we can even search the crate's items with keyboard shortcuts. If we click on the thread RNG function, we get to this definition. If we click on that return type there, we can check out the documentation for thread RNG. We see a description, and if we scroll down a bit, we can see the traits thread RNG implements, and we'll come back to what a trait is soon. RNG core looks interesting, so let's find out about that one. We see a description at first, and then if we scroll down, we can see the required methods and their documentation. Having a uniform style and interface for documentation is really helpful when exploring a library's API and when jumping between multiple libraries. <clears throat> Here's a pretty simple REST program just to show off a bit of syntax. The use statement imports names from libraries. Colon colon is used as a path separator and namespacing operator. Next, we define a function with the fn keyword. The function named main is the entry point. We call the ver function in the env module and assign the value it returns to user. Rust figures out the type for us. And ver is a result, or returns a result. So we have to unwrap it, which will crash if there's an error. We'll talk about what all that means in a minute. And next we have an if statement, which has braces but no parentheses. Um, note that we're comparing strings with equals equals, so we have operator overloading. And then we have this print line macro. The exclamation mark at the end of the name means it's a macro, and the string literal there is actually turned into a series of formatting instructions at compile time. And the compiler checks that, that we have enough arguments and that they're the right type. We can run cargo build to compile the program and then we can run it and it does what we expect. Although if the user environment variable is empty, it might be a bit confusing. And if user contains invalid UTF-8, it'll crash the whole program. <coughs> so, this type that ver and ver returns is result, which is an anon, which means it's a type that can be one of a number of different things. It's also a generic type, so we can pick any two types, t and e, and use a result type, which can either be an OK variant containing a t value or an error variant containing an e value. One way we can deal with that error is by matching on it, which is a bit like an is instance check. Here we'll just handle an error by printing a simple message. So if we have an OK value, we take that and run our logic from before, and if we have an error value, we throw it away using the underscore as a, place, a placeholder or wildcard, and just print that little message. So now when we run our program with invalid data, we print an error message instead of crashing. We'll talk about some other ways to handle errors as we go, but for the definitive rundown, check out Jane Ludsby's talk, Error Handling Isn't All About Errors. But this talk is about Rust value as a practical programming language, which means doing a lot more than writing hello worlds. So let's write a program in Rust and explore some of the ways the language helps us out. I have this receipt printer hooked up to my computer, and it's super fun to play with. There's no ink, so paper is incredibly cheap, and they're designed for restaurants and retail, so they're incredibly durable. I always forget to check the weather in the morning, so I want to write a program I can set to run before I wake up that, that tells me the weather and how it'll feel compared to the previous day. Weather APIs come and go, but right now OpenWeather is providing decent data for free, even if the default units are Kelvins. Here's a simple call of their API in Python. First, we load the API key from a JSON file, then we make a request, and finally we print out the response text. When we run it, we get a minified JSON blob as output. So let's work on recreating this in Rust. Here's a start at a line-by-line -line conversion of that program. Um, first, we're using the include stir macro, which actually reads a file as UTF-8 at compile time. We'll work on opening files in a bit, but this works well enough for now. <clears throat> 
Next, we're going to use the certy JSON crate to parse that string into a JSON value. And then we get the API key key out of the object as a string. Each time we assert something about the type of a value in this object, we need to unwrap it because we might not have a value of the type we want. So we need to deal with that somehow. Note that this isn't entirely unique to Rust, though. Our Python program would also crash if API key obj wasn't a JSON object, or if it didn't have a key named API key, or if the value of that key wasn't a string. But Rust makes us be explicit about all these assumptions that we're making. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It helps us figure out where errors could happen. But it is awfully verbose and painful to write like this. But we do have a better way. Here we're declaring a struct, which is roughly a class in the sense of a blob of data with named fields and methods, and then we're deriving some traits for it. So what's a trait? <coughs> a trait is a set of method signatures that specify some interface. Here the from trait lets us convert from one type to another. We can implement a trait for a type with an impl block. Note the self keyword there that indicates the impl block's type. That makes refactoring a lot easier and lets us talk about things like a function that returns the same type as the value it's called on. Rust lets us do a lot of funky things with traits, and particularly traits with generic types like these. Here's the into trait, which is from in the other direction. We can implement into u for all types t, as long as u implements from of t. The implementation is pretty simple if you can wrap your head around that. We call the u, we call use from method. And that's pretty magical. We only have to implement one of into or from, and we get the other implement, the other trait for free. So if we have this implementation from string for open weather config, uh, we can use the into method on the string type to convert to an open weather config object. But about that to owned call there, what's the deal? Shouldn't a string literal already be a string without calling another method? Well, in Rust, string literals get baked into the compiled binary directly. Because that data is always sitting at a fixed location in the library, we can't change it without copying it into memory first, because if we changed it there, it would change it for everyone else using the string literal. So if we want to have a string that belongs to us, rather than one referencing some data elsewhere in the program, we have to call the toOwned method to convert it, which creates a new string object and copies the data we need into it. Back to our open weather config struct. We don't have to implement every trait by hand, like we were doing with into and from. The other option is to use a derive macro, which is a function written in Rust that reads the type's definition as a syntax tree and automatically generates an impl block for us. There's usually a few requirements for deriving traits. In particular, for traits like debug, clone, and deserialize, we need all the types the struct is composed of, which here is just string, to implement the same trait. Debug lets us pretty print the struct's data, clone lets us deeply copy it, and certy's deserialize trait lets us deserialize it from JSON or with other certy libraries, XML, YAML, TOML, protobufs, and more. <coughs> Here's what deserializing to a value looks like. Note that we don't need to explicitly construct our open weather config object. That, along with parsing the JSON, matching up keys to fields, and recursively constructing other deserializable values, is handled by certy and certy JSON. Now, when we run this, we get some nice pretty printed debug output by default. That's not my actual API key, by the way. Don't worry. The next change I want to make is adding struct opt, which generates a command line interface from a struct definition. Instead of declaring all our arguments as strings and pulling them out of an untyped hash map, we just declare them as struct fields, which means we get things like auto-completion for our command line options, along with bonuses like detecting that option fields aren't mandatory and vec fields can have multiple values. We get a lot of perks from struct op, including this great generated help message. And we even, help, we even get help with typos by default. 
The next thing I want to do is add some error reporting so we don't have to unwrap everything and cause panics when something fails. The Error Crate by Jane Ludsby gives us the beautifully formatted error messages I showed off at the beginning of the talk and has a lot of other functionality we won't explore here. Now, we can handle errors with the question mark operator, which is a pretty simple but important bit of syntax sugar. The question marks are transformed into roughly these match statements. If we have an OK value, we take that value and use it. Otherwise, we return the error value from the whole function. We just bubble up the error to the caller. It's a little bit like throwing an exception, but we don't quit an arbitrary series of functions. We only go up one layer, and the type system doesn't let us ignore it. Using the question mark operator again, we're going to use the wrap error methods from error's wrap error trait to more accurately describe what went wrong. We just write a bit about what we were doing that might have caused an error, and then that string will get displayed if the error report is printed. It's a pretty simple step, provided you do it from the start, and it makes debugging a lot easier. Here we can try to use a non-existent file or an invalid one as our config, and we can see the error messages we get. These are pretty simple on their own, but they're especially useful when we have a bunch of layers of error context to figure out what we did wrong. And unlike exceptions in a lot of languages, we don't just get an enormous, unreadable stack trace by default. Now we're going to use the request library to make a simple call to the Open Weather API. We create an HTTP client object called the get method with the endpoint URL, add some query parameters, and send the request off. We can see when we pretty print the response object, we get all the fields we might expect, headers, a status code, and so on. And we can also print the response text, which is this big minified JSON blob. We're going to deserialize that too, but first let's clean up our interface to the Open Weather API. So let's unify our config file with the API client. Instead of passing an API key into every function call, we can keep it in the same struct that holds the request client. And because the client has a default value, we can tell Serdy to use that instead of expecting it in our config file. Now, we can just read our config, config object from the same JSON file we were using before without even a constructor method. Now, to make our API a bit cleaner, let's start implementing methods. This gives us something that looks a lot like the classes we may have used in other languages. And although Rust doesn't have inheritance or subtyping, generic functions and traits can get us pretty close. An impl block lets us put methods on types. Like Python, Rust doesn't have an implicit this object you can reference. You need to write it explicitly as self. We also have angle brackets after the function to indicate that the function is generic. Here we have one generic parameter named response, and the colon indicates a trait bound, which means that response needs to be a type with an implementation of deserialize owned, which is exactly what derived deserialize gives us. Essentially, we've copied a type parameter from the Serdy JSON from reader function so that we can deserialize to any type we define. We can define structs for the API responses. These are pretty much copied from the Open Weather API docs. And then we can define a helper method to make that request directly. <coughs> Note that we don't need to annotate the generic types for the self.get call, although we can if we want. The compiler is smart enough to figure out what the type parameter needs to be from the return type of self.get on its own. And then after, we can use the new method in our main function to get the forecast data as a richly typed struct. One thing I want from my forecast is to tell me if today is going to be warmer or colder than yesterday. So I'll create a temp difference in them and then a helper method to get the appropriate temp difference for two floats. Here's that constructor function, which takes two floats, calculates their difference, and matches them to the correct temp difference variant. We're also adding conditional statements to the match patterns, which, makes it help, which helps make it a bit clearer that we're determining which range the delta is in. <coughs> 
I'm really bad at arithmetic stuff, so I want to write a few tests to make sure I got the subtraction order and everything right. First, we have this config test attribute, which means the entire test module is conditionally compiled, so our tests don't get lumped into our other builds. We have to import the functions and values from the parent module, that is, the rest of the file, explicitly. And then a test is just a function annotated with the test attribute. And finally, we can write asserts with the assert and assert eek macros. We can run our test to make sure that we've written everything correctly. And another little thing I like about Rust, the type system lets me describe and check a lot of my code before it compiles correctly, so I end up writing tests that crash and fail immediately a lot less often than I do in other languages, which is a big boost to my self-esteem. I also want to be able to state various things about a collection of temperatures, like their range and their average, so I'll have a stat struct that'll handle that computation, storing the minimum, maximum, average, and number of values. Let's implement the default trait for stats, which gives us a way to construct a default value for a type. It's like Go's concept of a zero value, but Rust doesn't require that every type implement default, because that's not always meaningful. For example, types like file handles don't have a reasonable default. We're picking infinity for the starting minimum value because every float is less than infinity, and negative infinity for max from the same reason. Note that we have associated constants for even our primitive types. In Rust, prim primitive types are treated just like any other type, um, as opposed with like Java, where we have to treat um, reference types and primitive types really differently. Now we can construct a stats object from an iterator of floats. We can start by initializing a mutable return value and a sum of the iterator's elements. They need to be mutable so that we can change their properties and values as we go on through this computation. Next, we take each value in the iterator and update the return values, minimum and maximum values, if applicable, as well as the element count and running total. And finally, we compute the average value and return. Then, we can gather the temperatures for yesterday into a stats object. Note that because we're using lazy iterators, it, mapping each data point to the temperature it felt like doesn't require writing a whole new array. We just generate the data as we go, and there's no storage overhead. We can do the same thing with our forecast, making sure to limit the forecast to 24 hourly data points. And then we can get a temperature difference between the two days. To finish up, let's print out the data we've gathered. First, I want to print a smiley face for good weather, so I'll check if the average temperature today is between 60 and 80 degrees. Then we'll print the first line, truncating today's average temperature to two decimal places. And then we're going to print the rest of it. There's a bunch to break down here, so let's break it down. First, because printLine is a macro, we can do weird things with the syntax, like this keyword argument syntax that's only used for the printing and formatting macros. Next, we have a match statement. Rust's if, else, and match statements return a value, so we can use them inline like this for um, argument values. And then we're going to finish with a smiley face if today's going to be warm and nice weather, or a period otherwise. And after printing all that information out, our program is done. So building and running it, we can see what the final output looks like after I fix several issues with, smithing, with missing or superfluous white space. So now all we have left to do is print it out. We pipe our program's output to LP to print it. And here we go. And there's the same receipt, a little bit bigger. And before I go, let me leave you with one last piece of advice. If you're writing a REST program and you're trying to work with references and it's just not working, clone your data. Cloning can fix a lot of annoying problems, and it's rarely a performance issue when writing scripts or command line interfaces, 
particularly when compared with dynamic languages. But if you end up in those circumstances, you can always ask another REST programmer for help. Our community is full of kind and helpful people willing to share a few minutes of their time to help fix errors you don't understand. I certainly couldn't have learned REST on my own, and as long as you're respectful of your peers, we're all glad to help. Everything I talked about is just a tiny portion of what you can do with Rust and what Rust can do for you. There's so many features and tools I wanted to talk about that I didn't have time for. Things like adding methods to foreign types, type safe numbers, unit conversions, and more. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you do some amazing things with Rust. I'm Rebecca Turner, and this has been Rust for Non-Systems Programmers. Have a good one.